This is the seventh in a series of short podcasts designed for the families of children with chromosome 18 abnormalities. In this podcast, we will have a more theoretical discussion about how a chromosome abnormality causes disease. This is important because as more is learned about the role of the various genes, some of the information about the genes on chromosome 18 will impact us and other information will not. Here, we will discuss a framework for you to be able to understand these differences. In order to be able to think about the big picture of what is happening in someone with a chromosome abnormality, we will discuss this first in global terms. For the sake of this big picture discussion, we will simplify all of biology into a simple dogma. Genes are the instructions for proteins. Proteins have critical functions in biology that when working correctly result in a happy and healthy you. Therefore, that path is from genes to proteins to you. This is how we will illustrate the process. This diagram represents the normal condition. There are two copies of a gene shown on the left. Two copies of the gene produce a certain amount of protein shown by the blobs in the center. This normal amount of protein then results in a happy and healthy you. For the sake of this discussion, we will only talk about how gene copy number variations have an effect. We will assume that all the genes work normally to produce a normal protein. This means that we are ignoring a huge category of genetic conditions. In this discussion, we are concentrating specifically on the consequences of copy number variation. Next, let's work through some of the possibilities when there are too many or too few copies of a particular gene. There are three scenarios for what could happen if there are three copies of a particular gene. At the top is the white gene when in three copies this gene has some sort of dosage compensation mechanism so that even though there are three copies the normal amount of protein is produced therefore there are no adverse outcomes for you the blue gene on the other hand has no dosage compensation mechanism and therefore three genes produce three proteins this is 1.5 times the normal amount of this protein and that has a bad effect on you. The third possibility is the pink gene. Here, three copies of the gene produce one and a half the normal amounts of protein, yet for whatever biological processes that protein is involved in, it just doesn't matter. So you're happy and healthy. The point is, that just because there are three copies of a gene does not automatically mean there is a bad outcome. Some genes will have a bad outcome when there are three copies and some will not. A similar set of scenarios can happen when there is one copy of a gene instead of the normal two copies. The gene shown in white can be upregulated so that it produces a normal amount of protein and you are happy and healthy. The gene shown in blue makes its normal amount of protein, but because there is one gene instead of two, the total is half of the normal amount. And this is not enough for normal function. Thereby, this can result in disease. The gene in pink makes its normal amount of protein, but because there is one copy of the gene instead of two, the overall amount of protein is half the normal amount. For the processes that this protein is involved in to happen normally, half the normal amount of that protein is sufficient, and therefore you are happy and healthy. So here again we have three scenarios, some with a normal outcome and some with a bad outcome. From this thought experiment, you can see that one cannot assume that because there is one copy of a gene, there will be a disease state as the outcome. Our central challenge will be to figure out which genes adversely affect you when there is an abnormal gene copy number, whether or not there is an extra copy or only a single copy. 
So what do we know about the chances of any one of these possible outcomes actually occurring? There is much less known about the consequences of three copies of genes than about a single copy of genes. But there are data from multiple sources that lead us to expect that only about 10% of the genes will have a bad outcome when there is only one copy instead of two. What this means is that for someone with 18p- and a deletion of the entire short arm, a region with only about 50 genes, is that there will probably only be about five genes on 18p that have a major consequence for the affected individual. For someone with the largest possible 18q deletion, a region including about 100 genes, there are probably only about 10 key genes that have deleterious consequences. Wow! So this may not be such a big problem to solve after all, but we first need to determine which genes are those key genes. In order to explain how we go about determining which genes are the key genes, we need to go over some terminology first. First is the genotype. The genotype is a person's genetic makeup. In these discussions, we are mostly just referring to the actual size and location of a region of chromosome 18 that is either in one copy or three copies or four copies, something other than the normal two copies. The phenotypes are the manifestation of the genotype, so this would be short stature or a heart malformation or a kidney abnormality, or any of a hundred other uh, different features. In the case of the chromosome 18 conditions, we don't know which genes cause which phenotypes. The linking of these two is one of the goals of our research. This process is called genotype-phenotype correlation. What is a phenotype? A phenotype means the characteristic features associated with a particular gene. So, for example, a good phenotype would be short. However, there are lots of ways that children can get to short. They can have a hormonal abnormality. They can have a bone disorder. They can be malnourished. They can have growth hormone deficiency. Or they can have a resistance to the effect of growth hormone there are many different ways that you can get to growth hormone deficiency. There can be a structural abnormality of the brain, or there can be dysregulation of the way that the brain produces growth hormone, or the child could have had a brain tumor that resulted in the destruction of the cells in the brain which make growth hormone. So, for example, many of your children may have had a growth hormone stimulation test using a medication called clonidine. This is a fairly specific uh, test for whether or not a specific part of the brain can respond to a medication by releasing growth hormone. This may be the most specific test that one can do, but still there are many things that can interfere with the test. For example, the child has recently uh, eaten something. So even our ability to phenotype is somewhat limited. Now. We're going to try to put together genotype and phenotype. Here is a diagram showing how we go about correlating the genotype with the phenotype in order to determine where the key genes are located on chromosome 18. Although this diagram shows 18q deletions, the approach for finding the key genes is the same regardless of which chromosome 18 abnormality we are talking about. So here goes. To the left of the red line is the diagram of chromosome 18. In this example, there are four individuals shown uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, each with a different deletion of 18q. Their genotype is shown pictorially, and under each of their chromosomes is a list of their phenotypes A, B, and C. The way we go about determining where the genes for the phenotypes are located is as follows. To determine where the gene is for phenotype A, we look at only those individuals with phenotype A, as shown in the box. 
Then we ask, what is their common region of deletion on chromosome 18? This identifies the region at the end of the chromosome. We call that region the critical region for phenotype A. Likewise, if we want to know the region of the chromosome where the gene for phenotype C is located, we use the same approach. We select all of the individuals with the phenotype C, shown in the box, and then ask what is their common region of deletion. You can see that in order to do this in a way that identifies small regions with a small number of genes is to have a lot of people with a lot of breakpoints, including interstitial deletions. We also need to have accurate information about the various phenotypes. Genotype phenotype mapping may help identify the common phenotypes, but what about those phenotypes that affect only one or two people? Can these be related in some way to their chromosome 18 abnormality? The answer is yes. They can also be the result of a chromosome 18 abnormality. This is how we think that can happen for those individuals with chromosome deletions. As you know from earlier in this podcast, many genes on chromosome 18 are expected to have no ill effect when there is only one copy instead of two copies. However, this means that the single remaining gene must work perfectly. If it is not working perfectly, then you have no functional gene and a disease is likely to result. The chance that someone with a chromosome 18 deletion has a mutation within one of the single copy genes is very small. We estimate that the rare phenotypes that occur in only 1 or 2 percent of the individuals could be the result of this type of chromosome 18 related problem. Also remember that chromosome 18 is only one chromosome and only about 3 percent of all genes so there can be genetic issues completely unrelated to a chromosome 18 copy number change that have consequences for a child.